Welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, my guest today is the ever popular Dr. Brooke Goldner, and she's going to be talking about how you can get through the holidays without sabotaging your health or your weight loss. Please welcome her to the show. How are you? I'm good. I always feel like I should be running down to a stage when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking, speaking of holidays, how was yours? It wasn't that far. It was good. It was good. Took a few days off with the kids. It was actually really nice. Um, it's nice to relax sometimes. Even people with my energy level, sometimes it's good to sleep in and <laughs> chill out. So yeah, it's good. It's good. Nice. And mm -hmm. yourself? Very good. I We hosted for the first time since moving to Northern California. It was supposed to be 35 people. 31 showed up. There was a lot of food prep. That's and so a high turnout. And it's really, well, and all vegans pretty much too. And vegan doctors, up to 100-year-old vegan doctors. We have a 100-year-old vegan doctor here. He's amazing. Dr. John Scharfenberg. It was great so cool. to the holiday with him. But, you know, I can see why the, the mere mortals have trouble with the holidays because, I mean, there was just so much food. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's so important because un unfortunately, the holidays have really become more about food than anything else, right? Like people have forgotten what the holiday actually is supposed to be. You know, for every holiday, they're thinking about what they want to eat rather than, you know, either the, the spiritual value of the holiday if, or religious, if it's a religious holiday or, you know, whatever it is that, that the meaning was supposed to be, it's kind of just pushed down. Uh, and, and really it's about like, what are we going to eat? Uh, even vegans are like that, but you know, it's, it's, it can be deadly. You know, the, uh, the highest level of deadly heart attacks actually happens on Christmas. Really? I would imagine so. And, and I, one of the doctors was on call and he never even got to eat because I mean, there were so many heart attacks on things. I, I always, when I worked in the hospitals, I always volunteered to work Christmas because I, I don't celebrate Christmas. So I always volunteered to work Christmas so everybody else could be home. It's busy. Uh, it's busy. One, uh, depression is high uh, for people who don't have family to go to. So it's always important to check on your neighbors and people who might not have folks. Um, but yeah, chest pain, heart attacks. And it's like people are looking forward to eating the ham and the cake and the pie. And then it's the final, final straw, you know, and, and it's so important to not let ourselves kill ourselves or lose people we love over the holiday. There's so many ways to make it good. And I know you know that. Yeah. Um, but I, I like to always arm people with options because the thing that happens over the holidays, most folks get sicker and they gain weight, right? Over the holidays. One, they're wearing fluffier sweaters. So they're like, oh, you can't tell. <laughs> I have another portion of cake, right? Um, but a lot of people's goals for their health and their fitness level get totally sabotaged over the holidays. So I always like to have kind of two ways to go about it uh, for the folks who know they're going to eat badly anyway ways to at least minimize the damage versus how to actually keep yourself as healthy as possible over the holidays. You know, because sometimes people are like, you know what, uh, I might be listening to Chef AJ all day and I have good intentions, but I know I'm going to eat some of that stuff I'm not supposed to eat. Well, what do you do to mitigate that damage to minimize it for yourself? So I have tips that we can share for both ends of it to make sure everybody at least gets the amount of help they need. I, I know for a lot of folks, they really want to stay well over the holidays and they want to be fit. So maybe should I start there? What do you think? What do you want to start with? Absolutely. Well, I think, I think Dr. Goldner, this actually starts in, in, in October because I think, I think it starts with, with Halloween and it goes kind of downhill for a lot of people from that yeah. one holiday. I think you're right. It's like October through to January, it's getting worse. And then January 1st, there's a resolution. And then they start trying to get it back, right? And and you're starting at such a worse place than you were, for sure. I think you, I think it starts there uh, and, and goes down. Yep. People work so hard all year to be fit and maybe lose weight. And man, that one little Snickers bar on Halloween can just blow the whole deal for people. And, and some people probably wish they could just hibernate from Halloween to, to January 2nd and not have to deal. I think they kind the of do. They wake yeah. up to eat and then they're just kind of sedentary. But it can be dangerous for people with food addiction. And I know that you talk to people a lot about that Absolutely. a lot. Absolutely. that Snickers bar and you wake up uh, those addictions and it could take you months to get back to where you were. Um, so, you know, not everybody can, can get away with having a little bit 
some people it's going to be if I have a little, I'm, I'm a goner. Um, so yeah. So what do you think? What do you want to start? Do you want to start with like how to avoid all the things that make you uh, potentially eat badly and gain weight? Or do you want to start with, if you know you're going to do it, what to at least to do to well, minimize? Let's start with the avoiding because that would help people that can do it. And then if they can't, the second part. Also, I find okay. that people, are people, especially the, the women I've worked with, they're such people pleasers and they don't want to indulge, but they don't know how to say no because after all, their Aunt Harriet made it just for them. Oh my goodness. This is something that I actually, <laughs> I get people on this a lot during my rapid recovery group, because when I work with people every day for 42 days, if they're going to fall down, usually it happens during that time. And this is one of those uh, examples that I think about, I, I call it kind of the nobility excuse, like, oh, I ate poorly to make somebody else happy. Like you fell on a sword for somebody. And as long as you make it seem noble, it seems like a good excuse. And there was someone in my group who uh, she ate a cookie because her elderly neighbor gave her one and she wanted to be polite. And I, I got her on. I was like, hey, you, you ate a cookie when you're trying to heal from an autoimmune disease. This is, you know, we, we have to make a plan for how to do this. And so her first response was actually say like, well, next time I guess I'll just offend the old lady. And I was like, no, 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 you don't get to do that. I said, you know what? Old people pretty much raised me. My my mom's parents were my second set of parents. You know, they didn't have daycare back then. It was grandparents, you know. And uh, and so I, I learned to beat all of her friends at cards. Like I spent summers with them. I know old people. You know what they like? Your time. They want you to listen to their stories, right? Maybe they want some hugs. Maybe they want you to play cards with them. You don't need to eat their cookies to make them happy. I said, <laughs> there were so many different things you could have done. Number one, you could have said, no, thank you. But tell me more about your grandkids. And just spent time with them. Number two, you could have said, you know what? I'm not hungry. Let me take it for later. Wrap it in a napkin, take it home, throw it in the trash when you get home. There's so many different things you can do in the moment. But as long as you think that you have to eat poorly to make other people happy, you're always going to do that because you want people to be happy. And it's important to realize that if somebody actually cares about you, they also want you to be well. And it's okay to say, you know what? I'm off of sugar right now. That sure looks good. Eat a second one for me. But uh, anyway, how's the grandkids? You know what I mean? Like you don't have to make it into a big deal, but it's okay to say no, thank you. One, you can say no, thank you with no excuses. And I tell people that all the time. If you, you don't have to, like people want to prepare speeches for the holidays. I've had people say, can you give me a list of reasons to give at Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner for the people who ask me why I'm not eating what they're eating? And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. Oh, like, first of all, if you want to do that, get my son's book, 50 Comebacks for Vegan Kids, have it at the table. And if someone gives you something, you can open the page, protein, protein, what do they say? You know, or you can do it if you want, but I don't even think that's necessary. I think everybody at the table has free will and is allowed to eat what they feel like eating. And just like, you're probably not going to say, are you sure you're going to have that cake? I mean, you look like you put on weight. It's okay for you to eat a salad without being attacked for it. So if someone says, why aren't you eating meat? Say, I'm happy with the food on my plate. There's no, you don't owe anybody an explanation. Now, if you want to offer it, that's up to you. If you're saying, hey, I'm on a health kick and I'm feeling really good. Why are you eating that salad? Because I love it and I feel good. It doesn't have to be an attack. It doesn't have to be a fight, but you do have to prioritize yourself and your health if you want to be well, um, because it's not always going to be convenient. It's not always going to be what everyone else is doing, um, but it's for you. It's your health, your body. So I that people pleasing thing, I always tell people the most important thing to know about people pleasing is it doesn't work. You can't make someone else happy. If they're not happy, they got their own work to do, right? You got to work on yourself. And if somebody really cares about you, they're going to be happy that you're taking care of yourself. So yeah, that's not an excuse. Oh, I don't want to forget before we get into all this stuff, I want to make sure your audience knows, um, you know, I have these online classes that I do. It's uh <laughs> It's, it's all the information about my nutrition protocol for reversing disease and optimizing immune health. Um, I have online classes. And uh, now through the holidays, I'm actually having them online for free to try to help people not get sicker over the holidays. So it's my entire goodbye lupus protocol, case studies and different diseases. It's all, it's all the content. There's no like holding back or whatever. It's all in there. I've had people all over the world who've gotten rid of their diseases literally just from those classes alone. So if they go to goodbyelupus.com, those classes are free to January 1st, just for anyone who wants to just sit and watch them and learn. So if this hour isn't enough and you're like, man, I wish there was four more hours. <laughs> wow, can, that's so nice them. of you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I love to do that uh, to try to support people's health. And so, like I said, it's helped many people actually get healthy without ever needing to see me. 
And that's my goal. My goal is not to be busier, it's to make sure people are well. Um, so I want to make sure we don't forget that. So goodbyelupus.com, free classes, go watch and learn, and you'll know every detail that's in Goodbye Lupus without having to buy the book. You can just listen to it. All right. So that's one thing. I go over the science of how like omega-3s impact the immune system. Like it's all in there. So anyway, so I don't want anyone to, to forget that. So yes, yeah, so if you're trying to be well, one, you got to know what you need to do to be well, right? So you can go to those free classes, for example, and you'll be armed and ready, right? Number two, um, if you're going to a, a meal at someone else's house, you got to bring your own food and yep. you've got to make a decision in advance that that's all you're eating. So that one only works for people who have the ability to say no. That really depends on how far along you are, right? Like for you, chefs, you've been eating this way for so long. I have zero worry that you're going to get tempted by some sugar or some meat and eat the wrong thing. You're probably going to show up with your food, enjoy your food and feel bad for everyone else. That's what happens after a while is you don't feel bad for you. You feel bad. For, I feel bad for other people when I see them eat poorly. Right. But that takes a while to evolve there. So if you know that if you're surrounded by your own food, you're going to be fine, then take it and get pretty, you know, like you don't have to sit there with just a smoothie. Um, there's, you, you can make beautiful foods for yourself and salads and things and make it a really nice display for yourself so that you can enjoy it and stay full. Right. But you have to commit ahead of time that no matter what anyone else says or does, that's the only food you're bringing. And I always would bring enough for other people, too, because everyone's always interested in, in the healthy stuff once it's there. Right. I've made raw pies before where everyone ate that first. I'm like, wait a minute. What? That was mine. What? <laughs> <laughs> so um, so you, that's one thing. Definitely, you know, bring your own food and be ready to, to say no and feel OK with it. Um, if you're not there yet, because you're super addicted still, and you're still early on in your journey for weight loss or for health, I recommend people go after the food. You know, I was teaching people that over Thanksgiving, um, ask the host when dinner is and show up after dinner. So you're there for the karaoke and the games and the singing and whatever you're going to do. But that way you're not going to be sitting there tempted. If it's like a buffet style, sit in another room away from the food, like get your food, bring it with you and don't go into where the other stuff is. Um, I had a client that kept doing that. She would resist the whole time, but then eventually go walk and look at everything and then boom, cookies in the mouth, right? So you've got to make sure that you're you're really able to do that. If not, go after the food. Um, or I always tell people, you know, always go on a different day too. If they're having a big like blowout meal or something and you know you're going to be too tempted, say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to be able to come on that day. But would it be okay if I stopped by the next day, the day after, just to spend that time with you? Maybe we can go for a hike together or we can do so, you know, so it's quality time without the stress of the food. Um, because when you're really early on in recovery or weight loss and you can't say no, the best thing you can do is avoid the temptation. Uh, it, it gets better over time where it's not so tempting. Um, but yeah, that, that's usually my suggestion if they already know they're not going to be able to say no. Um, so, or the other thing you do is host your own, like you did for your Thanksgiving. I've hosted plant-based Thanksgiving for my whole neighborhood. And when we were in Austin, it was so fun. None of my neighbors were plant-based, but they asked me for recipe ideas. And they all showed up excited and interested to see what's going on. What are we eating? You know, it, it, so if you host your own, you can make it raw vegan. You can make it plant-based. You can, it, you can give ideas for recipes and it's going to make it so much easier because now you're in control of what's going on there. So I always like to do that. I like to take the control and host it myself. And that way, everyone who comes over my doorstep is plant-based. Like there's no animal products in my house. Uh, so even my employees, like they, they, they're going to have to go <laughs> out if they want to bring, if you're coming in, there's plant-based in here. So it's, it's a safe place, you know? So all of those suggestions I find really work for people. And, and I'm working to help people have more recipes. I actually, I haven't shown anyone yet. You want to see a yes be seen yet? So I have the proof for my new book, Goodbye Lupus, Hello Delicious. It says proof across the front. It's the first, you're the first one to see it. Well, now everyone is watching. That is so it. cute with the chef's hat and the doctor's coat. Oh my God. Yeah. I didn't want, I wasn't going to wear the hat and Tom insisted and it's cute. Yeah. I'm wearing the hat. Um, but yeah, so this is like stuff that's not smoothies that'll help heal people with recovery, you know, and there's like beautiful meals in here, but, um, you know, so to help people with ideas that are not just like, um, this is one of my favorite things actually is these raw tacos and stuff. So for people who are looking for more exciting things, this is going to come out before Christmas. This is the proof. This is, so we're going over the final proof before we publish. That's what's happening right now in my house. So, um, so that's really exciting, but I mean, 
the internet's an amazing place. Chef AJ is an amazing resource. Like there's so many resources out there to make food that's healthy and is going to be fun and enjoyable for yourself. So, um, so I recommend people do that. That way you're not feeling like I always joke around with people. Don't just sit there with a salad using your own tears for dressing and feel left out. Like you can make beautiful things. So that's what I suggest for people who are really trying to stick with it. Make sure you get your workout in, make sure that you um, eat the right foods no matter what. You know, for a lot of people, they'll admit to me, they already know they're going to eat something bad over the holidays, that that's their time of year where they are going to eat either something that's an animal product or that they're going to eat some of that pie or cake, whatever it is that they know they're not supposed to have. So in those cases, and, and really, you got to check in with yourself because for people who are very sick, this could be life ending. I said there's high, you know, highest level of deadly heart attacks are on uh, Christmas. Um, I've had people with kidney failure where one bite of a mini Snickers put someone back six points on their kidney function. Like it can be life ending for people who are seriously ill. So be careful if you're choosing this option. Like is, I always ask people, ask yourself, is it worth it? Like, am I, what would I rather have functioning kidneys or a piece of pie? Like sometimes that's really the choice you're making for other folks. It's like, they're generally okay. They're, you know, they're just trying to eat better to have a healthier life, but they're not in, in mortal peril if they eat something that's that's bad for them or they're trying to lose weight, right? Where it's less less of a scary situation to eat off plan. So I always tell you, if that's the case and you're going to do it anyway, we have a lot of tips to help, all right? One is make sure you eat the good stuff first. Mm-hmm. So wake up in the morning and drink the green smoothie, get the nourishment in because you're going to need it to fight back against what you're planning to do for yourself, right? Bring that big salad with you. So before you eat anything else on the table, you have to eat a full plate of salad first. That's first. What does that do? One, you get the nourishment in that can help prevent some of the damage or at least repair some of the damage. But the other is it'll give make you full. So now you're going to have less room on the plate or in your gut <laughs> for whatever's on that plate, right? So if you have less room in your stomach, you're less likely to eat as much of the bad stuff. So I think a lot of times people avoid healthy food on holidays and they wake up and they're eating cookies and brownies and then they're moving on to all the different bad stuff. And by the end of the day, they're, that's why they're sleeping with their pants unbuttoned, right? So at least minimize the damage by eating well all day and then eat that one thing that you thought you wanted, you probably won't like it as much as you think you did, but eat that one thing, but have done that. Number two, make sure that you get your exercise in, especially if weight loss is your goal. My husband has tactics actually in his book, uh, Miracle Metabolism. He has tactics for when people accidentally or on purpose miss their food uh, goals for the day, whether it's for muscle building or whether it's for fat loss. So if your goal is fat loss, and you ate like a loaf of bread and pie, then bodybuilding exercise is actually what you want to do. Sometimes people think that they're going to run it off with cardio, but actually a better bet. And these tactics are super cool in his book, but it's, you know, cause everybody messes up sometimes, but the better thing to do when you're going to, when you overeat is actually bodybuilding, because you're going to force some of the sugar into the muscles to build muscle size rather than all that sugar going into body fat. So when insulin's released, it's going to tell your, your body to absorb that sugar. If you're bodybuilding, like really bodybuilding, that sugar is going to be pulled into the muscles more than into fat cells. But if you're not bodybuilding, it's all going to go into fat cells. So you're still going to get some fat from it, but you're going to send a lot more into muscle tissue. So it's a little hack. Now, I'm not saying to just like, you know, do a bunch of pushups and eat pie and want to lose weight. But I'm saying if you do it, do the cardio too. It's good for your heart. But if you lift some heavy weights, do some squats, you know, the biggest muscles in your body are in your legs, right? Do some squats. And that way, at least some of that sugar is going to go into building the booty and the legs rather than all going into body fat. So those are some things that you do. Make sure you keep the workouts in, make sure you keep the good foods coming in. And that way you can minimize uh, some of the damage that you would do from the, from the stuff that really isn't good for you. You know, I agree with you about um, having the healthy food first, because if people are full, whether it's full on nutrients or a belly full of potatoes from starch, it doesn't mean they won't indulge, but th there's going to be less impetus and less, less room to do it, you know? Still crowding out and it works. That's one of the things I do for my clients who have food addiction, who aren't ready mentally to give up what they're addicted to. 
I'm like, I'm not going to tell you to give it up because if I do it, all you're going to think about is how much you want it. But before you're allowed to eat that thing, you have to get in all of these vegetables, all of this water, right? So I give them all this food that they have to eat first. And then if you're still hungry and you still want it, then you can have that. And it works because psychologically they know they're allowed to, but they have to nourish first and they end up not wanting it a lot more often because they're already full and you know, they, they don't need it as much, especially exercise. Exercise releases endorphins. And so if you've already gotten a great hit of endorphins, you might not need the sugar to give you the endorphins anymore. If you don't exercise, your brain's going to seek out another way to get those endorphins and, and food is a very quick and easy way. And brains are smart. They're always looking for the quick and easy way. Absolutely. And what about alcohol? Doesn't that make it more difficult for people to make healthy choices? Well, sure. I mean, uh, you never hear about drunk people making great choices, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, give, most, me this, give me this, give me, give me a green schmurdy. Yeah. yeah. Most people were making bad decisions when they're drinking. I mean, I remember in college, the only time I thought it was a good idea to eat cheese fries at 3 a.m. was if I had something to drink, right? Like that's just not like people don't make good choices about food when they're drinking, right? None of us do. Um, so one, alcohol is inflammatory, so it's not a good idea. Uh, if you're sick, right? But if you're not sick, I, usually people can have some sometimes. I, I have a, a, you know, what I teach is if you are healthy, you can get away with recreational eating or a glass of wine or something like that here and there, and you're gonna stay healthy. If you're trying to get healthy, it can hold you back. So there's a difference between what healthy people can do and people who are sick can do. Um, but even if you're looking at weight, yeah, uh, if you, once you loosen inhibitions, it's very hard to be in control of your choices. So it is a really good idea to uh, to not drink alcohol if you're trying to make better choices around food, for sure. Absolutely. You know, I feel like that people that are people pleasers struggle more than people that don't for so many of the reasons you said, and that they almost need to do some kind of like role playing or practice before they get to the event. Yeah. And it's also important to unravel that. So you know, the idea of people pleasing, it, a lot of times there's these cute names given to really serious conditions. And people ple people who are pathological people pleasers, what they're really saying, what's really going on inside of them is I'm afraid that I'm not lovable enough and that people aren't going to love me or care about me. And so I have to do things to earn that love. I have to do things to make people want to like me. And so because they're constantly feeling so unworthy and so unlovable and so insecure, they do things that they normally wouldn't do thinking that somehow it'll make people like them more. So I think in the short term, things like role play can help because you're preparing yourself. But in the long term, getting the psychological help. Um, I unravel this a lot in my in my group because I get to know people and I can't help it. I help people with all the emotional aspects of it. So if somebody keeps falling down because of this, then we start working on undoing that, working with their inner child about like, why did you grow up thinking you weren't enough? And who gave you that message? And are you willing to let go of that idea and say, you know what? I am enough. And somebody who cares about me is going to love me equally if I eat a salad or a piece of cake. Like that doesn't make sense. I should, you know, and then I'm allowed to take up space and be in a room and not have to earn anybody's love, right? So that takes emotional work um, so that you feel safe showing up in the world, just being yourself and eating what you want to eat and not feel like you're letting anybody down. So there's so many levels to this. So one is remember, you know, people pleasing doesn't work. If someone's unhappy, they're unhappy, no matter what you eat or do, they're unhappy. You're not going to keep somebody else up. It kind of, this image just came into my head. It's kind of like uh, if you saw the Titanic, when somebody's like, oh, I know how I won't drown. I'll stand on this other person. But now the other person underneath you is drowning and you're drowning too, right? Like you can't, you can't try to help. Someone can't prop themselves up on top of you and then you're underneath them. It doesn't work. So they need to do their own work if they're unhappy. But you also have to start working on like, why do I feel like I need to do this? And am I allowed to just be a person living my own life, eating what I want to eat and not feel like I need to work to earn people's love. So that's that's work you want to do with a therapist or somebody who's trained to do that um, because it's not really about the food and it's not because you just love to please people, but it's because there's an emptiness inside of you in, in your own sense of yourself. I think you came up with a new diagnosis, the triple P, pathological people pleaser. That's what I call it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why, because it is pathological. It's different than acts of service. You know, the love languages, like I, I'm an acts of service person. I love 
doing things for people. Like it makes me happy. If somebody needs something and doing something, something it makes me feel good. Um, but, but it's not, I don't feel like I have to do that to earn someone's love. It's something I like to do to just see someone smile, you know, like, Hey, I made you something, or I saw this and it reminded me of you. Those are nice things to do. And it makes me happy, but I don't feel like I can't, you know, that I'm not enough. Like, Oh my, I have to do what's going to make this person feel comfortable. Oh, no, they can do what they need to do and I can do what I need to do. Right. So it has, it's pathological. So it, yeah, it's a, it's slightly different. It's the, that compulsive need to do what you think is going to make you more acceptable to others rather than doing what you know is right for yourself. What is the motivation of the food pusher? Cause it doesn't matter to me if you eat my food or like it. So why does somebody get joy if they eat the food or angry if they don't? I, I, that's what I never understood from the other side of the equation. So people who get mad that you're eating healthy or, yes. or just, or that you won't eat their food, whether it's healthy or not. I mean, sometimes people are actually full, you know, I've never had someone get mad that I didn't want to try their food. Um, but there are, I did get attacked once by a lady at a party. It was the weirdest thing. This was years ago. Um, I'm trying to think if Alex was born yet. <laughs> this was a long time ago, but I'll never forget it because it was so jarring. It was a, it was a, like a Super Bowl party. And my husband and I went because we wanted to just be with these people. We were friends with the person hosting, but we didn't know their other friends very well. And it was a Super Bowl party. And so we brought a veggie platter with a thing of guacamole to eat. Because that's what we wanted. We were there for the fun. But if you wanted something to nosh, we just grab a broccoli, dip it in some guac, chew it. And, and we were having a great time talking to everyone. And there was one woman there who was morbidly obese. And she kept giving me these horrible looks. And and just and I was just like, I wasn't doing anything. I'm just myself all the time, just having fun time. She finally, she goes, you're not supposed to eat healthy on Super Bowl. Um, <laughs> Where is that written? I, I didn't. I don't know. That. I don't know. But she was. And so then she kept saying stuff like that. And we weren't even talking to her like we weren't preaching about food. We were talking about the game. We were talking about goofy stuff. We were laughing and just eating. We were just eating, but we weren't actually talking about it. We don't preach to people at a point. We let them do whatever they're doing. But she was taking it personally that we were eating vegetables and got angry, like so angry at the end of the party. She goes, I just want you to know that my kids ate an entire bag of chips by themselves today. And then she slammed the door. And I was like, are we in a fight? Like, I didn't even know I was in a fight with this person. I don't even know this person. But it was interesting because what it showed me was in her mind, the entire party, she was assuming that we were judging and that we were looking at what people were eating. And none of that actually happened. We were completely oblivious to what anyone else was eating. We were just talking to our friends and eating veggies. But she got very angry with us without ever having had a conversation with us. So but what that means is she's terribly insecure about what she's doing. And I think she's aware that she's eating unhealthy. She's aware that her kids are eating unhealthy and seeing other people eat healthy makes her feel insecure and judged. But none of that actually happened. I didn't even, like I said, I didn't even notice her until she was yelling at me. And I was like, what happened? <laughs> why, did, why is this lady mad at me? I don't know what I did. Um, so I do think there are folks who they already know, listen, I got a cholesterol problem. I have a blood pressure problem. I got a weight problem. I should not be eating this. And when you don't eat it, then they start projecting that feeling on you to say like, you know, because if you weren't eating healthy, then I wouldn't even be thinking about this right now. I'd just be blissfully eating my chicken wings and not thinking about it. But because you're sitting there eating vegetables, now I'm feeling insecure because I know I should be doing better. So, it's, but it's uncomfortable to feel like I need to do better. It's far more comfortable to be mad at you. And so it's, it's called projection, right? So um, thankfully, uh, being a psychiatrist, <laughs> I'm aware when somebody yells at me that I'm not associating with, that has nothing to do with me. That's why I said people pleasing doesn't work. Well, it's for the same reason. When somebody is unhappy, that's because of what they're doing in their life. And so sometimes being the one person that's eating healthy, you become the target of their anger. But it's not because of you. And you don't want to try to make them feel better. Like, okay, I'll eat cake so you cannot feel bad anymore. They need to feel that feeling. I hope after that party, she actually started think eating healthier. I, I hope that that was a turning point where she said, you know what? I acted really weird and I shouldn't have done that. And I shouldn't have blown up that way. Maybe it's time for me to start eating some vegetables, right? Like I hope, 
that that happened because sometimes the best thing that can happen to somebody else is that they're uncomfortable because when you're uncomfortable, that's when you contemplate change. If you're comfortable, no change will happen. Right. So sometimes we do make people uncomfortable when we eat healthy, not usually as dramatic as that, but sometimes we do, but that's good for them. Let them feel that discomfort. Don't take that away from them because now you're robbing them of the opportunity for them to grow, for them to go, wow, you just ate really healthy at Christmas. I could do that. Like I had an alternative experience once where I was at a hotel. It was late at night. We just got to a hotel. I want something to eat. We go to the restaurant and this was one of the worst hotel restaurants I've ever seen. Nothing had no meat. And so um, one of the appetizers though was Brussels sprouts with bacon. So I was like, oh, they have Brussels sprouts. So the waitress comes over and I said, can I just have a giant plate of Brussels sprouts with salt and pepper? Like steamed Brussels sprouts. And she and Tom goes, oh, that sounds good. Two of those. Right? So she looks at us a little weird, comes back with like a mountain. Each plate had a mountain of Brussels sprouts. And it was delicious. I love Brussels sprouts. Salt, pepper, we ate them. And when we were signing our bill, the waitress came over and said, I just want you to know that you changed my life today. We said, what, what did we do? We ate Brussels sprouts. She goes, well, I've always wanted to be vegan. And I thought it was something that was impossible to do at restaurants. And I just watched the two of you in action and realized, you know what? I could do that too. And I'm going to go for it. We didn't even talk to her about it. Like all she did was see us eat Brussels sprouts and something opened up inside of her. So when you're doing the right thing, the right for yourself, the right thing happens to other people, even if they get mad or irritable, or if they get inspired, those are all things that they need to feel. But what's most important is you're doing what's good for you. That's a great story. So people are saying, like Bit saying, the first bite is the only bite we can refuse. Yes, yes. I had that experience when I was getting my health back. It was when I was an intern working, you know, overnight shifts, multiple days a week. And the sugar at night, when it's 3 a.m. and your pager goes off and you jump out of the bed and then you have to walk past a gauntlet of sugar at the nurse's station because that's how they stay up all night is sugar. So it's like donuts and cookies and cakes. Oh, my. Right. Once it gets like 3 a.m. and you're kind of woozy, it's so easy to just grab a bite of something. And I learned pretty quickly, if I broke off a piece of a donut on the way to see that patient, it could be an hour or two hours later, I will come back and finish that donut and eat a second one. But if I could get through the gauntlet without tasting it, I would forget about it as soon as I was past it. So I had to learn that lesson for myself is that, you know, if anything, like grab a carrot to eat as I walk by or put my water bottle in my mouth. But if I avoid the first taste, I'm golden. If I taste it, that's it. It's over. Yeah. So it, but I would still make sure I ate my veggies after that because at least I got the good stuff in. But that is a really good way to go. The first bite is the only one you could refuse. That's it's so important. It's so true. You're not golden. You're goldener. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, Diana says, I truly love this woman and her family. I owe her my health. And there's a comment from Diana that it makes other people feel uncomfortable because they make excuses for their unhealthy habits and they realize that it can be done. So it's sort of like, you know, hey, I can't do it. So let's sabotage everyone else. Well, it makes people feel more comfortable. It's kind of, I always joke about it. That it's kind of like, you know, in the old movies where you'd see people smoking marijuana and then puff, puff, pass, right? That if everyone's doing it, then it, then everyone feels okay about it. But if one person says, no, I'm clean and sober, I don't do drugs. Oh, you're ruining the buzz. Oh man, you know, like everyone gets uncomfortable, right? Well, when you give up eating animal products and sugars and stuff, you're clean and sober. And that's going to make some people uncomfortable and other people inspired and all of that's perfect. Um, but it can be difficult at first. Once they know that's you, it's not a big deal. I mean, I, I make new friends on a regular basis. I just made some friends at a book club and we're all different. Right? I'm the only one that's plant-based in the group, but one of them is Muslim and she doesn't drink. And, and, and it turns out the one that one person I met, her daughter is autoimmune disease. And because she met me, her daughter's now coming off a of medication, all because she met me at a book club, right? But like whenever we um, hang out, they always make it plant-based for me. And I'm the only one in the group that's plant-based and they've never asked me, they just do it automatically because they're so kind and so nice. But it's just one of those things that you, you can be yourself. You can be uh, someone who doesn't drink for religious reasons. You can be someone who doesn't eat sugar. You can be plant-based. You can be whatever it is that you want to be. And you have every right to show up and have fun and be respected for it. Yeah. I think some people, this is so stressful. They avoid the holidays altogether. Yeah. But that can make, that can, that can make it hard too. Like I remember when we lived in California, Thanksgiving was fun. 
because Animal Acres, they've changed. They're now a farm sanctuary, but it used to be Animal Acres. Do you know that place? Yes, I used to love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the only places I've ever taken my kids to see animals has been to sanctuaries. Uh, We've never gone to like circuses or zoos or anything like that. But we would go to the sanctuary. It used to be Animal Acres. It's now Farm Sanctuary. But on Thanksgiving, they would have an event where you could feed the turkeys. So we made our own little Thanksgiving tradition where, and the kids love that kind of stuff, where you go and you give like cranberries and stuff to the turkeys and hang out with the animals. And so that was a fun thing to do. So, you know, if your whole family... Uh, is is already plant-based anyway, then you can just do your own thing, your own tradition. Um, before my husband became plant-based, we would still go to Thanksgiving because he wanted to eat that stuff. And I would just bring my own like stuff that I would eat. Um, but I was super happy when, when he didn't want to go either. So then <laughs> it made it a lot easier. Or we went on a cruise one Thanksgiving with, uh, with extended family and we did everything with them except the meals. And nobody, they all understood why. You know, so we would meet them for the shows. We'd meet them at the pool, but we did salad bar for our, for our meals. And, you know, and that was fine. We didn't want to sit there and watch everybody eat that junk. And, you know, it was happier for us to spend less time doing that and more time having other fun. So, you know, I think if you're, the other thing is to just let people know, I think if you're going to go to a party or get together and they don't know that you've changed your diet, that can also make it uncomfortable. So another one of my tips is always that, you let the host know, listen, um, I'm eating plant-based now, uh, but I just want you to know I'm coming to your house because I love you and I love your company. Don't worry about the food. I actually got it handled. I'm going to bring enough for everybody, but I'm just going to bring you know, some salads and other stuff. Um, but just so you know, like, don't even offer me what you got going on there because I already know your food's delicious and I might get tempted. So do me a favor. Don't even offer it to me. Just let me enjoy your company. So you ask them in advance not to offer it to you. Um, A lot of times when people uh, hear you're on a diet, they think it's kind or supportive to say, oh, it's okay. What's one day and actually sabotage your diet. So I one bite bite won't hurt one bite won't hurt, Right. which sometimes people think that's being kind. And so when in fact, it's sabotage. So I always tell people, let them know how to support you. And the way you support me is by encouraging me and don't offer me anything. Cause it's still, I'm still getting over that addiction. And if I have a bite, I'm going to blow my diet. So, you know, just let me, I'm going to bring my own stuff, but that way the chef's not kind of, or the host isn't caught off guard and, and they don't know what's going on. And then everyone's uncomfortable. You let them and say, I'm doing this health kick right now. And I'm eating weird. You can make it a joke. I'm eating weird. I'm eating plant-based, whatever. So I'm going to bring my own food and I'm just going to come to enjoy the company. And so just don't even offer me that delicious pie you make because I already know if I taste it, I'm going to blow my diet. So like letting people know also takes the stress off of it because then you don't show up feeling like, oh, I hope they don't notice I'm not eating the turkey. And what are they going to say? You've already explained it. And anyone else is there. It's none of their business. Why are you eating salad? I love salad. Like there's this, you don't have to go unless you want to go down that path. But I find most people who are questioning you while you're eating aren't really interested in learning. They're just trying to pick it apart. So I always say, you know, say something like, oh, I love salad. I've been eating plant-based, but anyway, tell me more about your grandkids. Like you change the subject, but, or you say like, you're interested in learning more. I have some great resources and links for you. Remind me after dinner and I'll, I'll give you all the websites and see if they come and ask. <laughs> Sometimes they will, most of the time they won't, but yeah, just don't go in defensive. So, you know, when people say one bite won't hurt, I always say, yeah, but it certainly won't help either. So, you know, <laughs> Yeah, well, it just, it, it won't help, um, but it definitely hurts because, you know, like we just talked about, I mean, once you activate the, the dopamine pathway from that sugar, I mean, now you're, it's kind of like having that first drink, right? Now you're, you're disinhibited and you've got cravings um, versus if you go, yeah, that looks great, but I'm full or whatever, and you don't actually let yourself have it. Yeah, that one bite. It can hurt, especially, like I said, in things like kidney failure, lung failure, where every bite can damage you beyond recovery at that point. But for most folks, the biggest problem that happens from that bite is they then get rid of all of the progress they made in overcoming that food addiction and they're starting over again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Somebody suggesting tell people you're allergic to that food. What do you think about that if it's not true? Do you think? Well, it depends if it's, I mean... I'm kind of a, I, I, I am, I'm very honest all the time. <laughs> so it's kind of like, for me, it would never come to my mind to say something like that. I think the only time I've ever done that is like on the school forms, when they say food allergies, I always put meat, dairy, honey, whatever there, just so the teachers take it seriously. But if someone asked me directly, I would just say, oh, no, thank you. 
And if they say why, I can say, oh, I'm plant-based or whatever, but, or vegan, people know the word vegan better. Um, but I, I usually don't, but if you're never going to see them again and you want to say that, that's okay. Um, but again, it's, it, that's more of a, I hope they don't get mad at me, but if that works for you, okay. I mean, we had someone who was in my rapid recovery group who was doing so well. And he was worried about going to a wedding because all of his family members drink heavily. And he didn't want to explain to each person at this wedding that he's not drinking right now. So instead we just had him drink his water out of a Moscow mule cup all night with a lime on it. Nobody asked him what was in his cup. So he just kept that cup full of water and he danced and had fun and nobody even asked him what he was drinking and that worked too. So, you know, sometimes it was, if it's alcohol, you can fake it like that. Um, with food, I mean, I guess it's up to you if that works for you, but I think in general, that's kind of still a, a, a symptom of people pleasing. You're afraid to offend them by saying it's not healthy or that you don't want to eat it. So you're just going to say like, no, I'll, my, I'll, my airway will swell up and I'll die if I eat it. Um, so yeah, if it's, if it's a baby step towards it, that's fine. But again, I don't think you owe anyone an explanation. Um, you're allowed to just say I'm on a health kick. Or just no, thank you. But I, you know, I, there, there, we have, I, 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 there are some food pushers in my life and it's like, it doesn't matter what it say. I have a medical condition there. It's just weird how that is so important for people to get, to get you to eat their food. It's just, it's, it's bizarre well, to me. And the first like my grandmother, she used to say to me sometimes, listen, Brooksy, you want to eat that little chicken soup? I won't tell anybody, you know? And I'm like, grandma, <laughs> like, she, you know, like, but that didn't come from her wanting to hurt me like in her mind i mean she was a jewish grandmother chicken soup like this is and important. Still in. Yeah. yeah so so she was she thought it was loving her her love language was you know cooking meals for people so i used to make food for her whenever i went there um but but um it was just cute i would just laugh i'm like grandma I, i'm not i don't want it but thank you i actually don't want it i'll just pick the chicken out no <laughs> Thank you anyway. Let's just stick with the salad. It's good. But, you know, for her also in her generation, I mean, she starved through World War II. So her biggest fear was being thin. She always wanted to keep a layer of fat. She was a round, round little lady, you know, and she always wanted to keep a layer of fat on her because starving was the, one mm. of the worst things that ever happened to her. So she liked me better when I was bigger, too. Mm. So I think part of her, too, was like wanting to fatten me up. You know, she's like, you were more beautiful when you were a size eight. You know, and I'd be like, thanks, yeah. grandma. But I had lupus and kidney failure and blood clots back then. And I kind of like my size now and my health. But she was, it, it wasn't coming from a place where I felt negative. You know, there was no negativity. It was just her fears and her stuff. So I was able to just kind of give her a hug and thanks, grandma, but I'm actually happy. Um, so, you know, you just, you have to be willing to say like, see where it's coming from. And if it's someone who's just like, they don't know better, you can say, thanks so much. I, I appreciate it so much. But yeah, I'm actually really full and I enjoyed my meal. But you know what? I just want your company, you know, and and to be able to move through it without feeling like, you you know, get into a place of panic and defensiveness. Yeah. Uh, Susanna says, have you ever considered writing a book on the psychological aspects of eating this way? Yes, I did. It's called Goodbye Autoimmune Disease. <laughs> so so what happened was Goodbye Lupus was a story of my recovery and the uh, the six different types of foods that can, you know, they're important for reversing autoimmune diseases, right? So six steps for reversing autoimmune diseases, the foods to avoid the foods to eat, right? Goodbye Autoimmune Disease, I originally was going to write it as all case studies in reversing autoimmune disease, but what started pouring out of me was all of the emotional work. Like if you read Goodbye Lupus, it's a small book. It's meant to be something you can read and implement because I'm very practical. Like let's read and implement, right? Let's make it as easy as possible. If you didn't implement it, why? And so most of it, while there are dozens and dozens of case studies and reversing many different diseases in that book, the first section of it is all the emotional stuff. So self-sabotage, people-pleasing, um, lifestyle habits around sleep and self-care, depression, anxiety. Um, basically what I did is I went in my rapid recovery group and I took videos of me coaching people and I with different issues and I turned those videos into chapters. Um, and, and, I, and I wrote those chapters based off of the coaching I was giving. So anyone who couldn't work with me that way could at least read about it and work through it. And so a lot of people told me that that book's what actually what they needed to commit, that they knew they were supposed to be plant-based and they knew they were supposed to eat this way but they emotionally weren't ready yet. And so they needed, like, I literally have stuff where I say, stop now and do this assignment. 
let's work on this. And so um, people have told me it's made a big difference for them to actually work through the psychological reasons that they're not taking action on what they already know, right? Like if someone's watching us right now, maybe they just found us through YouTube promoting some live content. Most likely they've already been consuming content about eating better for their health. But if you're not acting on what you already know, there's an emotional component to it. And unfortunately, it's not addressed. I don't think it, a lot of people have the capacity or the ability to address those issues. I mean, I'm a trauma specialist. I know how to address these issues. But I remember meeting a, a surgeon once who was, he, he actually hired me as a keynote speaker for his event because he found through surgeries, orthopedic surgeries, that people, uh, their joints were healthy when they were plant-based. Like people who were vegan or plant-based who got injured, their joints didn't have inflammation like other people's. And so that started his journey. But when he told me that he tells all his patients to be plant-based and if they don't do it, he just says they're non-compliant and fires them and that's it. And I was like, wait, 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 change doesn't work that way. Most people don't just go, oh, thanks, sir. And then they eat better for the rest of their lives. It's a whole big adjustment emotionally, psychologically, because it's about addiction and it's about self-esteem and it's about traditions and it's about your resistance to peer pressure and all the things we just talked about. So yeah, Goodbye Autoimmune Disease, I, the majority of that book is about all of these different emotional aspects and, and how to deal with them so that you could just eat what you're meant to eat. Nice. Thank you. Um, Diana says, I'm working on my grandkids eating better. They're used to the sad way. How do you transition kids that don't want vegan? I've tried using the vegan meats to transition without them knowing. <laughs> I think what you do a lot depends on the kids' ages, but no matter what, I think that your house has to be your safe place for your food, right? So anyone who comes to my house, as I said, they're playing based while they're here. So when your kids visit, you're the healthy grandma and they're going to eat lots of fresh foods. Let's eat fruits and vegetables. You know, you can make them, you know, grains and beans and all sorts of different things. You can have them participate with you. I find that kids love to participate in choosing the foods and, and making the foods. Uh, they're more likely to eat what they made. If you want to get fruit, I used to do when my kids were little, I used to make rainbow plates. And so we'd make a big plate and we'd, and we'd try to find every color of the rainbow and make it out of a different food. So it might be like, tomatoes and tangerines right and so all the different colors of the rainbow all the way down and then i'd usually make like a little tofu flour and a flaxseed cracker stem or something like that um and we'd make like different pictures i posted pictures online a long time ago when, when my kids were little where we would make pictures out of fruits and vegetables on their plates and then they would eat their pictures so when they're little i find it fun to play with the food that way but also to have them help pick it out but you know if a kid is hungry they'll eat so I've always had a rule, even when my kids were little, that if you don't like what I made, I'm always going to make something healthy. And if you don't like what I made, there's the fruit bowls and you can eat fruit. And if they want to eat an orange and an apple and a banana for dinner, great. They ate some nutrition. It's fine. Um, so you can always have that rule that like, listen, I'm not going to make something that I know is unhealthy because I love you too much. I always add that line because I love you too much. Um, but if you don't like the beans and quinoa, you know, that I made, what would you like? We have apples and oranges and blueberries and all these other things. And so that they have choices, but choices within the realm of what's acceptable for you. And you're allowed to do that. And, and it might be something that, that really changes their lives. When I worked at a nonprofit with the homeless for years, I was a medical director at a nonprofit where we're, we're working with the homeless and kids aging, well, adults aging out of foster care and juvenile justice. I was the first person most of these people ever met that offered them a vegetable, but I always had a veggie platter on my desk. And whenever they'd come to see me, they'd sit down and, hey, help yourself. And for a lot of them, they never even knew what some of those vegetables were, like a red pepper. Like they'd never seen these things before. And I have some of them that are still in contact with me today over a decade later who will tell me that they eat healthy now because I gave them that opportunity to taste it, to experience it. And some of them started asking about smoothies and we started, the nurse started bringing in blenders so people could have a smoothie if they want, instead of like the pizza that we would have. Um, instead of just being able to, they used to be able to earn uh, little tickets um, for coming to classes to learn about self-care, you know, and, and all the things they needed to, to come out of homelessness and everything. And uh, they could use those tickets originally at the local pizza place or liquor store, not for liquor, but like to buy like chips and monster energy drinks and stuff like that. And there was so much interest because of my veggie platter. And I wasn't pushing it. I just had it on my, plate, my table because I was eating it too, that they ended up asking for this. And we were able to get a, a partnership with the, um, um, oh, what do you call it? Uh, farmer's market. 
And the farmer's market started accepting our tickets. And the kids started, I call them kids, 18 to 25. They started preferentially saving up their, their tickets to go to the farmer's market instead of going to the pizza shop. So a lot of times people don't even know what they're going to like until you just give them that opportunity. And if they hate the food, fine. I mean, most kids will eat fruit. But again, giving them, instead of just giving them what they're used to, if you give them that opportunity that when I'm at grandma's house, I eat well, that can start planting some seeds in their mind that when they have more choice over their food as they get older, they might want to be more like grandma. Mm, yep. So Ellen wants to know, are you a specialist in emotional trauma or emergency critical care trauma? Oh, no, no, no. Not critical care, to emotional trauma. Yeah. So, um, so my uh my background so people understand it so i was a i was a genetic researcher and then i became specialized in psychiatry and neurology then specifically in emotional trauma depression anxiety and then in uh the cellular impact of nutrition on so how nutrition affects cellular repair and uh, immune function so what i found is even as i transitioned into teaching people how to eat to repair their cells the emotions kept coming up so i find that in my daily life i still do both because I find changing your nutrition, you have to, you have to deal with the depression, the anxiety, the addictions and the traumas, or they're never gonna be able to fully embrace the nutrition or the stress and inflammation caused by those problems will keep combating the nutrition and they won't get healthy as, as quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not fixing gunshot wounds. Like that's, <sighs> that's the whole thing. Yep. <laughs> Bit would like to know, is it okay to hypernourish a five-month-old baby, smoothies or juice, any chance of making my baby allergic by feeding him vegetables before he's six months? No, no, you're not going to, so you're not going to hypernourish a baby because remember hypernourishment is a nutrition overdose for people. So, but if you want to give your baby some of the smoothie, yeah, I gave my baby smoothies starting at four months, five months, um, and they love them. You know, originally I diluted them with breast milk. Uh, and then as they got older, like when they weaned, they weaned onto smoothies and water. There was no adding other milks or other things like that. Um, but kids love it. And what I find is it creates a, um, they, they build a taste for it. So my kids, I didn't give them like the rice cereals or anything like that. They had smoothies and then their next food was avocados, which you can easily scrape and put right into their mouth. Um, bananas, you can mash up. Other vegetables I would blend up originally with breast milk and then without it. So they were completely raw their first years of life. First year was all raw foods, either blended or smoothies. And to this day, they love vegetables. Um, my son, Alex, will just sit and eat spinach like other kids eat chips because it tastes good to him. You know, my son Solomon happily will just grab a handful of cherry tomatoes or, you know, carrot or whatever. Like they, they, they crave these vegetables and things, because that's what they eat first. Now, because they're healthy, they have eaten other vegan junk food. They've never had animal products, but you know, they'll have a vegan cupcake at a party or something like that. And, and usually what they'll tell me after a few bites is it's too sweet. Um, but, um, but you know, they, they've tasted other things or, or they'll have like, you know, um, my son went with his friends to a party at a pizza place where they make a, a pizza with vegan cheese or something. And he had that, right. So they have inflammatory things sometimes, but they don't crave it. It's more like I had it, but now I kind of don't feel good. I, I think I need to eat some salad or some sweet. Like they can feel the difference in themselves and prefer to eat the healthy stuff. So I think when you start kids off right, then they crave the good stuff and they don't have the same addictions. You know, when, when I see people whose kids are sick and I've helped people, you know, kids as young as two years old with kidney issues and autoimmune diseases, and then they're, they're, their only diet is macaroni and cheese and hot dogs and chicken nuggets. And the parents say that's all he wants. I'm like, well, there that's because he's addicted. That's because all that's all you gave him. Yeah. And so when kids, they don't have logic. So if you give them that crap and then you offer them an avocado, they might not want it. But I, I always tell them, I, like, you created an addict. And now you're gonna have to deal with the withdrawal and the tantrums, but they'll get past it and they'll eat again. But if you do the opposite, where you raise them on these healthy plant foods then they don't seem to, ha they have a resistance where they actually crave healthy stuff and, and they can have other stuff without going crazy for it and, and having the same addictions that those of us who had to overcome bad eating have. And that's most people, unfortunately. Yes. Yeah, I mean, including myself. I mean, I had to overcome. I mean, I grew up eating macaroni and cheese and, and Chef Boyardee and, you know, my parents owned a pizza shop. 
So I eat pizza every day in my teens. And I thought I was lucky. Like what teenager doesn't want to get to have pizza every day? Um, but you know, I was a lupus and kidney failure by 16. So, you know, um, so most of us have to overcome that. But if you have a baby starting fresh, wouldn't it be amazing to raise them without food addictions? It's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. Yep. Like Dr. Goldhammer's kid. <laughs> grew up at the center. B says, how do you stay motivated and not order out so much during the holidays? I don't think I've ever ordered out. Over the holidays. Yeah. Well, I mean, so your motivation comes from the reason that you're doing what you're doing, right? So this is a big part actually in my book, Goodbye Autoimmune Disease, was like, you have to have motivation, right? So normally motivation comes from, you'll have a spurt of motivation at first. That will last about two weeks and then it wears off. That's why January 1st, the gym is full. And then January 15th, it's empty again, right? That that spurt is gone. The, the type of motivation that keeps you going means that you've got a real emotional connection to why you want this for yourself. And it's got to be big. Like, what are you missing out on in life because of your poor eating right now? So not just like, I want to be healthier. I want to live longer, you know, but like, I want to be able to hike, you know, to, to the top of a mountain. I want to be able to walk all day long in, it, you know, in Europe, I want to be able to do, you know, like you have to have these like really big things. I want to be able to chase after my grandkids instead of sitting on the couch in pain. You have to be very, very clear on what it is you want from your life. And then anytime you think about ordering out or having something else, ask yourself, what do I want more? Do I want to be able to walk through Venice all day long without being in pain? Or do I want to eat pizza? Do I want to get off dialysis or do I want to eat chocolate? right? People forget. They just think about like, oh, I shouldn't eat that. And that will work until it doesn't. That's a dieter's mentality. Oh, I shouldn't eat that. Maybe a little bit, you know, maybe just not now, maybe tomorrow, maybe I'll go back to this versus actually holding up what you want for your life next to whatever that thing is, that's going to last 30 seconds in your mouth and be gone and say, is it worth it? And, and that's how you have to battle it. You have to get real with yourself about what am I really risking? Is it worth throwing away this dream I have for my life so I can have this? And if the answer is no, then you don't taste it. <laughs> you don't do it, right? Stay full also. If you stay full, you can think clearly. Hunger creates a psychosis in your mind where you can't think clearly anymore. So you can also put it off and say, you know what? If I still want it after my workout, I'll have it then. If I still want it after I eat my salad or have my smoothie, I'll have it then. So kind of delay it and see if you can fix uh, the craving by just getting yourself full and getting that dopamine uh, rush from some exercise that usually can can make that difference and get you out of that moment. Yeah. Ellen wants to know, did your parents change their diet? Uh, yes. Yeah. Actually, my mom had rheumatoid arthritis and it was hard for her to change her diet. And it was actually this whole thing um, that we went through because uh, she was struggling because uh, pizza and chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> those were those things. And so for a while, you know, we were vegetarian when I was growing up. And so for a while, um, she really didn't want to embrace eating this way. And well, she intellectually might, but kept eating junk. And it, it actually got between us a little bit because she would complain to me about how much she hurt. And then I'd want to lecture her on her food. And then we both leave feeling unhappy. And so I finally said, you know what, as long as you're unwilling to change your diet, um, I can't really listen about the pain. It's not fair, you know, because it hurts me to know you hurt and to know you're not willing to do what, it, what you need to. So she tried everything else first. She tried surgery. She tried steroid injections. And then finally she was limping around. She actually tells this story better than me, but she, she said uh, one day she was visiting us and she could hear me, you know, coaching someone through my office door. I guess I'm loud. And she said she was limping up and down my staircase and so much pain in her knees and she had this realization, she goes, what the heck am I doing? And she didn't tell me, but she made a decision that day that she was going to go on my protocol. And she went home and she went on the protocol and she called me after a few weeks and said, just so you know, I've been fully on the plan, doing my smoothies, eating my raw veggies. My joint pain is completely gone. I've lost 20 pounds and I feel amazing. I was like, oh, thank you. So since then, she is fully on the plan. So she does smoothies every day. And then she makes like vegetable soup or, you know, some tofu or quinoa and beans. And she's maintained her health pain free and slim. And my mom has abs. We go to boot camp together in the morning. Um, so she's great now. She's, she's in great shape. But even with what I do for a living and what I teach every day, she still struggled to do it because it's different when your kid's telling you what to do. I would say it's hard to raise parents, you know? So, you know, she had to come to it on her own 
but yes, she did. And, uh, and she's pain free now. So that, that makes me super happy. Um, you know, sometimes you, you have to take a step back to let people come to things on their own. Um, yeah. Yeah, Ellen's, Ellen's on saying, is she willing to come on Chef AJ live and tell her story? <laughs> My mom is so shy. Uh, mm-hmm. she does not like to be in front of the camera. Um, in fact, I have had her on my YouTube before, but the only way I got her to do the video is if she didn't have to look at the camera. So she's only looking at me so that she, cause she's like, she gets so, so sweaty and uncomfortable and just does not want to be in front of the camera. So my, my instinct is she'll say, no way. Oh my God. <laughs> There's too many people. Um, whether I could drag her next to me, maybe. Uh, but she, I did convince her to, she is in a video that's on my YouTube. Um, but it took a whole lot of convincing. Um, and like I said, you'll see, she never once looks at the camera. She's just I, looking I, at <laughs> I want to see, what is the video called? I want to, I want to see her. Oh, let me see. All right. I'll pull it up for you. And then I think we have to wrap up. It's been over an hour. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got to yes, let you go. So tell people where they can find you because you, you know, we didn't talk about the medical questions today because you do a, a, a Q and a every single week. Yes, every Wednesday. Okay, so if you look, by the way, the channel, the video on my YouTube is called My Mom Talks. Nice. So if you just look up mom on my YouTube, you'll see the first video uh, is my mom. Here, I'll show it to you really quickly. So I'll show you all the things. So, okay. All right, so see this one right here? There she is looking at me. (laughs) Your mom is blonde? She is now. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) The gray, the gray was a battle and now she's blonde. She used to be my hair color, but yeah, now she's blonde. And she's she's gorgeous. It's gorgeous, honey. She's gorgeous. So, um, and she's got the New York accent. You'll love her. So that's that. Um, So if you, uh, if you want to ask me questions about anything every single Wednesday, except for like a holiday or something, uh, I am live. It's, it's live streamed on my YouTube, my Instagram and my Facebook all at the same time. So if you look up at Goodbye Lupus in any of those places, Wednesdays at 1230 Pacific. All right. So if you come on then, uh, that's 2.30 Central, that's 3.30 Eastern in other countries. You're going to have to Google it, but 12.30 Pacific, I do it every every Wednesday just to answer people's questions and keep them on the right path and keep them inspired and all that kind of stuff. Remember my classes right now, goodbyelupus.com, free classes on all the things you should eat to reverse the diseases and why, so you can keep yourself inspired and on track over the holidays. Uh, I want you to get well. Imagine you heal your disease over the holidays and you start 2024 healthy rather than starting 2024 at your unhealthiest and overweight, like a lot of people do after the holidays. It's it's cool. So that's why I'm doing that. So goodbyelupus.com for that. And yeah, I'm always around. I'm always posting on social media and trying to get people to do what it takes. You know, I've been, I know what it's like to be sick. So everything I can do to inspire people to, to take the steps they need to, to get healthy makes me happy. Absolutely. And hopefully you'll be on before your book comes out so we can promote it. It's coming out soon. I'm telling you, it's coming out before Christmas. This is our final thing was we had to print the proof. You know what it's like. You have to see it. Because when you're looking at the document on your computer, it's not the same. So now I have it in my hands. We're doing final edits and uh, we'll get the next proof. And if it all looks good, we'll be launching it. So it should be in the next couple of weeks, actually. So. All right. Good. Well, then you can I'll let you know. Or you can come on even if it's not your slot. So we'll just move you up or something like that. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Goldner. It was so fun. It was great to see you. You're so welcome. I'll see you soon. Absolutely. And thanks all of you for watching. Thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow a little later at 1 p.m. Pacific for plant-based cardiologist, Dr. Andrew Goldman. Gold, that's not his name. You're gold. I'm tired. I never do a show this late. Dr. Andrew Freeman, he's going to be talking about